In this video, we will remember how dangerous the oceans can be and dive into the history of tsunamis, talk about modern pirates and the most brutal pirates of the past, and dispel myths and truth around ocean creatures. Tsunamis are a terrifying natural catastrophe capable of obliterating everything in their path. This immense wave typically emerges from earthquakes, and as it approaches the shore, the watery wall can surge tens of meters high. A staggering 80% of the largest tsunamis occur within the Pacific Ring of Fire. Just imagine, this destructive force can attain an incredible speed of up to 805 kilometers, 500 miles per hour. These waves would take merely a day to effortlessly traverse the Pacific Ocean. The most significant tsunamis in history have always left behind dreadful consequences. A significant number of casualties, thousands of people from various countries lost their lives, homes destroyed, irreplaceable damage to crucial infrastructural sites, and at times even small towns vanishing from the coast. Infectious diseases spread actively due to the catastrophe, resulting in increased mortality. People struggle to find sustenance, suffering from a shortage of potable water. The most massive tsunamis leave behind tons of debris, mud, and muck. Years are required to mitigate the aftermath and recover from such a terrifying catastrophe. Now we'll provide you with the list of the world's 10 biggest tsunamis, causing catastrophic destruction and suffering. Number 1. Northeastern Coast of Japan, 2011. In March 2011, a powerful nine-magnitude earthquake triggered a devastating tsunami that ruthlessly struck the northeastern coast of Japan. Official records report nearly 16,000 casualties, with an additional 2,500 people gone without a trace. Anomalous waves obliterated the island nation's coastline. Witnesses recall the largest tsunami wave, reaching over 40 meters in height, sweeping across Miyako Island. Unfortunately, in addition to all the horrific aftermath, a technological catastrophe occurred. One of the most massive tsunamis in human history caused a Level 7 nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Thousands of residents had to abandon their homes to escape the effects of radiation. Number 2. Papua New Guinea, 1998. Enormous 15-meter-high waves of destructive power crashed over the northwestern part of Papua New Guinea, due to a powerful 7.0 magnitude earthquake. The number of casualties exceeded 2,000, with at least 500 people missing. Cracks emerged, and many residents found themselves homeless. This devastation was accompanied by another calamity. The earthquake triggered the appearance of underwater landslides. Several local villages were forever wiped off the face of the earth along the northwestern coast of Itape. Australian authorities rushed to aid the affected, sending humanitarian aid by plane and setting up field hospitals. The United Nations also reacted, advising Papua New Guinea's authorities to modernize their tsunami warning system and work on evacuations in coastal cities. Number 3. Sulawesi Island, Indonesia, 2018 The residents of Indonesia's Sulawesi Island suffered from one of the world's biggest tsunamis quite recently. The cause remains the same. Underground shocks, with a magnitude of 7.5 on the Richter scale. The earthquake generated waves reaching up to two meters high that crashed into the city of Palu. In the surrounding areas, uncontrolled water flows led to mudslides, sweeping away everything in their path. 4,340 people perished, and over 10,000 sustained injuries of varying severity. The tragedy's day also coincided with a massive ethnocultural festival. Number 4. Lituya Bay, Alaska, 1958 The largest tsunami in human history, recorded in 1958 in Alaska, was preceded by an 8.3 magnitude earthquake. This natural disaster was so vast and devastating that it earned the name Mega Tsunami. The earthquake triggered a landslide, after which rocks with ice began falling into the bay en masse. This rockfall formed the largest tsunami wave, an incredible height exceeding 500 meters. The disaster claimed five lives in Lituya Bay. Fortunately, only one settlement was in the vicinity, suffering from infrastructure destruction. Eyewitnesses describe how the water wall literally ejected their boats from the bay into the open sea. Number 5. Nankaido, Japan, 1707. Let's journey back into the distant past. 
On October 28, 1707, the residents of southern Japan faced an immensely powerful 8.7 magnitude earthquake. Subterranean shocks were accompanied by landslides and tsunamis. Enormous waves crashed onto the coast of Kochi. The aftermath of multiple catastrophes was horrifying. More than 5,000 people perished, and around 60,000 to 80,000 houses and buildings were destroyed. Hunger and panic reigned long after the catastrophe. Researchers discovered that this earthquake would eventually lead to the eruption of Mount Fuji. Fortunately, the lava eruption didn't occur, but ash rained down on the nearest settlements. Number 6. Krakatoa, Indonesia, 1883. An even higher toll of lives was exacted by the tsunami following the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano. May 1883 witnessed a deadly natural disaster in Indonesia, obliterating the northern part of Krakatoa Island. The eruption was preceded by a column of smoke above the previously dormant volcano. Throughout the summer months, the force of the eruption continued to grow, culminating in massive explosions on the morning of August 27th. A substantial amount of dust and ash rose to a height of up to 80 kilometers, plunging the day into an impenetrable darkness. The most powerful explosions generated waves reaching 30 meters in height, targeting the islands of Java and Sumatra. The eruption of the Krakatoa volcano, along with the ensuing tsunami, claimed over 36,000 lives and washed away hundreds of cities and settlements. The aftermath of this catastrophe was felt across the globe. Number 7. Southeast Asia, 2004. An unimaginably massive tragedy unfolded in the Indian Ocean in 2004. The most deadly tsunami in modern history emerged that year due to an underwater earthquake. Enormous 15-meter waves mercilessly struck the coasts of Indonesia, India, Thailand, and neighboring countries. Ruthless water currents raced at an incredible speed of 720 kilometers per hour. This tsunami became a true curse, claiming the lives of anywhere from 225,000 to 300,000 people. The exact number of victims is impossible to determine as many of the deceased were swept directly into the Indian Ocean. Around 5 million residents of Southeast Asia required assistance due to this natural disaster. According to various researchers' estimates, the earthquake's magnitude ranged from 9.1 to 9.3. The consequences were so extensive that they were felt by residents of South Africa, almost 7,000 kilometers away from the epicenter. Number 8. Northern Kuril Islands, Kamchatka, 1952. Information about the Northern Kuril Tsunami which occurred in 1952, was meticulously concealed by authorities. The first expert reports about the tsunami surfaced six years after the tragedy. The number of casualties and the extent of damage were kept secret until the early 1990s. Another tsunami on our list triggered by a powerful earthquake with an instantaneous magnitude of nine. Destructive waves struck the coasts of Kamchatka and the Kuril Islands in less than an hour. Severo-Kurilsk suffered the most. 1,200 residents perished, nearly 20% of the city's population. According to the local police chief, the total number of casualties reached 2,336 people. However, modern researchers are confident that the death toll could reach 15,000 people. Number 9. Chile, 1960. The most powerful earthquake ever recorded on our planet was felt not only by Chileans but also by people in distant countries. Underground shocks with a moment magnitude of 9.3 to 9.5 in 1960 triggered a volcanic eruption, landslides, and a deadly tsunami. Waves reaching heights of 10 meters traversed the entire ocean at an incredible speed, reaching even the shores of Japanese islands and Hawaii. The tsunami also managed to cover a distance of 9,000 kilometers, reaching the coast of California. Approximately 6,000 people perished, most of them falling victim to the tsuna. Number 10. Philippines, 1976. Closing the list of the largest tsunamis in history is a deadly catastrophe that struck the Philippine coast in 1976, claiming the lives of 5,000 unsuspecting people. The wave heights during the tsunami exceeded four meters. The cause of it all was an earthquake in the Cotabato Trench. The island of Mindanao in the southern Philippines suffered severe destruction. This catastrophe is considered the most massive in the country's history. Somali pirates are arguably the most notorious cutthroats of modern times. 
According to experts, in 2010 alone, these maritime raiders managed to earn over $238 million, committing over 100 successful attacks. They can easily be called the most famous modern sea robbers. Their ship raids in the 2000s were discussed by practically all global mass media. Maritime trade suffered billions in losses. But in 2013, information about the pirates suddenly disappeared. What happened to them? And how peaceful is the Gulf of Aden today? Let's start from beginning. Somalia inherently has a history typical of many African countries of the last century. Once an Anglo-Italian colony, it became an independent state in 1960. Nine years later, in 1969, a coup occurred, and a military dictatorship was established in the country. Mohamed Siad Barre declared that socialism would be built and consequently received support from the Soviet Union. Mohamed Barre, having taken over the state after these events, made the right move. He announced the building of socialism and accordingly received support from the Soviet Union, whose experts undertook the modernization of Somalia. The country developed industry and agriculture and built hospitals, schools, and roads. Ultimately, the population of this impoverished state had hoped that everything would be fine. But happiness was short-lived. For reasons known only to him, Bara decided to wage war against Ethiopia, friendly with the Soviet Union, thereby losing USSR's support. Naturally, the regime had no chance of surviving independently. A civil war began in the country, and by 1991, it was divided into parts. Chaos ensued, predictably. Europeans could not miss this opportunity and appropriated the resources and minerals available in Somalia. Ships from other countries fished in Somali waters, while toxic substances and harmful wastes were brought to Somalia. During wartime, no one could do anything about this. The result did not take long. Fish left the waters, and with them, the population lost its last source of food. To avoid dying of starvation, people began engaging in criminal activities, slave trading, drug trafficking, piracy. Now, about the pirates. The first raids were spontaneous and unorganized. However, over time, piracy stood on its feet and turned into the only source of income for coastal regions. For Somalia, the rise of piracy had a positive effect. Coastal cities flourished and expanded with the emergence of restaurants, legal firms, banks, elementary schools, hospitals, and drug markets. A prototype of a financial exchange was formed where locals could invest in pirate raids and then receive a part of the loot. For example, one woman invested $4,500, and a Corsair team increased her capital to $4 million. Meanwhile, Europeans also benefited. Insurance companies, private military firms, and trade organization leadership prospered. Goods significantly increased in price due to pirates. The pirates themselves acted cautiously. They did not kill hostages and did not rob goods, limiting themselves to ransom. On average, the ransom cost was $5.4 million per ship. The raiders approached the ship, opened warning fire, and forced the captain to surrender. The pirates' activities positively impacted the lives of Somalis. Cities on the coastal line rapidly became wealthy. Something akin to an exchange even emerged. People had the opportunity to make investments in favor of a team of filibusters and receive a certain percentage of their income. Millionaires also appeared here. One of them was Hassan Abdi. He started as a regular raider and became a leader of many pirate organizations and a businessman. The variety of pirate attack strategies was not diverse. On boats, pirates approached a ship from another state and made warning shots, thus forcing the ship's captain to surrender. As for income, the raiders earned it through ransoms for people they took as hostages. It cannot be said that the hostages lived too poorly while companies prepared their ransom. They were placed on the shore, where they calmly consumed local alcoholic beverages and food, getting acquainted with the local culture. The pirates deserve credit. They did not rob goods, which only increased the product's value. Wealth went not only to them, but also to insurance agents and security organizations. The Somalis managed to escape poverty, 
albeit at the expense of others. But politics did not leave people in peace. From 2004, Somali pirates were under the cover of Al-Shabaab, an Islamist organization. This was a union of the country's youth, which decided to unite the state, end anarchy, and enforce Islamic laws. Naturally, pirates with their activities did not fit into this picture, but they received patronage because they paid 5% of their own income. In turn, Islamists supplied them with weapons and allowed them to use ports under their control. By 2011, the organization managed to unite most of the territories of Somalia. Europeans did not like this order of things, as they lost control over resource extraction. In the end, the Somali government forces, supported by American aviation and Kenyan military, recaptured all cities from al-Shabaab. The pirates, however, lost their support. It was then that al-Nahyan, a family of sheikhs from the UAE, began to act actively. Their wealth was based on oil extraction and sales. The pirates occasionally captured their tankers. Until this point, Arabs were afraid to confront the pirates. But now they used the services of the private American firm Blackwater Academy. It took the mercenaries less than a year to eliminate the corsairs. The huge fights against pirates was carried out within the framework of the European Union naval mission Atalanta, launched in 2008, and NATO's Ocean Shield operation, which has been conducted since 2009. Patrolling of Somali coastal waters by European warships has been approved until 2014. At the same time, since March 2012, EU ships have been authorized to attack ground targets. This mandate allows warships and helicopters to strike at fuel depots, trucks, and other facilities in the coastal zone. Thus, the region was freed from pirates. Only once since 2012 was an oil tanker captured. But the Somalis are again experiencing hunger and continue to engage in internal wars. At least there are no problems in the ocean. In recent years, following the decline of piracy, Somalia has continued to face significant challenges. The country's situation remains complex, marked by ongoing political instability and economic struggles. Despite efforts at national reconciliation and attempts to rebuild, Somalia's government still confronts the daunting task of restoring peace and security across its fragmented regions. The threat posed by militant groups, particularly al-Shabaab, remains a significant concern. These groups continue to carry out attacks within Somalia and across its borders, destabilizing the region and hindering development efforts. The government, supported by international allies, persistently battles to regain control over territories still under militant influence. Now, let's talk about some of the most brutal pirates from the earlier history. In the movie series Pirates of the Caribbean, there was even a pirate with a real-life counterpart. The pirate known as Blackbeard, whose real name was Edward Teach, was born around 1680 in Bristol. This legendary pirate operated in the Caribbean Sea from 1713 to 1718. The facts about this pirate are intertwined with many speculations and legends, but let's try to unravel it all. His maritime career began at a young age when he became a privateer in the English fleet and participated in the War of Spanish Succession. As the name suggests, this was a major European conflict over the possession of Spanish territories, including vast colonies in the New World. The part of the war that unfolded off the coast of the New World was referred to by English colonists as Queen Anne's War. Edward Teach participated in the war as a privateer, representing a private, non-military vessel that legally attacked enemy ships. After the war ended, like many other privateers, he turned to piracy. Soon he captured a French merchant ship, naming it Queen Anne's Revenge, and became its captain. Blackbeard armed the ship with forty cannons and hoisted his famous black flag, depicting the devil holding an hourglass and piercing a heart with a spear. Along with three other sloops, Queen Anne's Revenge terrorized the eastern coast of the Atlantic Ocean. In May 1718, Blackbeard sailed into the harbor of Charleston, North Carolina, where he captured several ships and took people hostage. 
After receiving a substantial ransom from the local authorities, Blackbeard continued his pirate activities. By bribing the governor of North Carolina, Edward Teach obtained a pardon document and resumed his pirate endeavors. Blackbeard's most potent weapon was the terror he instilled in his opponents. He embedded lit fuses into his massive beard and entered battles engulfed in smoke. Those who faced him believed they were confronting the devil himself. He always carried at least six loaded pistols, a cutlass, and a musket, wearing his signature tricorn hat adorned with feathers. The governor of Virginia offered a high reward for his capture, and in 1718, Blackbeard was killed in a fierce battle. After the fight, they found five bullet wounds and more than twenty saber wounds on his body. His head was severed and hung from the ship's bow. However, there was a pirate even more ruthless than Blackbeard. Edward Lowe gained notoriety as a psychopathic pirate. He established his fleet in Nova Scotia, where he seized 13 fishing vessels before moving to the more profitable Caribbean. Alongside his pirate successes, his cruelty and infamous reputation as a heartless man grew. Edward Lowe's wild antics included inflicting severe injuries on his captives, such as mutilation, burning people alive, dismembering them, and even forcing members of the captured ship's crew to consume their captain's heart. Rumors suggested that he enjoyed torturing people more than obtaining money and valuables. Even the most desperate pirates found Edward Lowe's methods unacceptable. After three years of his captaincy, Lowe's crew revolted and marooned him on a deserted island. Many times, a pirate's life at sea could be short, with various stories causing their demise. Captain Charles Vane serves as a prime example of a pirate's brutal and brief existence. English pirate Charles Vane, a contemporary and even a friend of Blackbeard, began his pirate career in 1716 and became a captain in 1718. He earned a reputation as a ruthless and savage individual, feared and despised by his own crew. On one occasion, after capturing another vessel and looting it, Captain Vane chose a crew member for a public hanging. Remarkably, the condemned man survived. He was taken down from the noose, but found that he was still alive. Then, one of the pirates hacked the man's collarbone with a cleaver, while others set the ship on fire. However, the unfortunate man survived this ordeal as well. Furthermore, he managed to reach the shore and tell the gruesome tales of Vane's brutality. In an effort to prevent a similar situation on another captured ship, Vane's crew bound one of the captives to the bowsprit, burned his eyes, and with a pistol in his mouth, forced him to reveal the whereabouts of hidden valuables. While male pirates may have been more common, that doesn't mean female pirates didn't exist. Some of them even became ship captains. One such story is that of Jeanne de Belleville. In 1343, her husband, Count Olivier Thorff de Clisson, was accused of conspiring with England against the French king, Philip VI, and sentenced to death by beheading in Paris. Jeanne, his widow, swore to avenge her husband's death. She sold all her possessions, including jewelry and lands, and equipped warships. As a captain, she took to the seas, pursuing and sinking French merchant ships, killing their crew members, and even attacking coastal settlements. However, her luck ran out when her ships were destroyed in a storm, and she lost one of her sons. She had to flee to England, where she found support from King Edward III. After some time, Jeanne equipped new ships and continued her vengeance against the French, even after Philip VI's death. She only stopped a few years later when she remarried, this time to the captain of the English forces. But the most famous female pirate of the golden age of piracy is Anne Bonny, born around 1700. She was the result of an affair between a successful lawyer and his servant. Due to the scandal, the family had to move to the British American colonies. Her father acquired plantations, so Anne grew up in a large colonial mansion surrounded by luxury and servants. Unfortunately for her parents, Anne had an uncontrollable temper. Stories about her youth include riding naked through the neighborhood on a horse and stabbing a servant with a knife. As she grew older, she ran away from home with an English sailor. 
Their marriage was short-lived, and she soon found a new husband, the notorious East Coast pirate Jack Rackham, also known as Calico Jack. Anne became his right-hand woman, thanks to her planning skills and bravery in battle. Jack and Anne plundered ships in the Caribbean. In 1720, they encountered a well-armed English military ship and engaged in a fight, resulting in their capture. Anne was sentenced to death, which was postponed due to her pregnancy. The execution was delayed multiple times for unknown reasons, and her ultimate fate remains a mystery. Kraken, a legendary monster from Norwegian and Greenlandic fishermen's tales, it is a massive mollusk capable of dragging an entire ship to the bottom of the sea. Norsemen have a saying, to fish for kraken, believing that this monster spews a vast amount of semi-digested excrement. Whole schools of fish follow, feeding on the detritus. In reality, giant squids do indeed exist. However, the sailors' fear of a creature with eyes so large has somewhat exaggerated their size. The largest specimens reach 13 meters in length and weigh about 275 kilograms. A squid can overturn a small boat, mistaking it for prey, but it is not capable of sinking ships. Sirens. Myths of various peoples often mention water humanoids, half human, half fish. For example, mermaids, beautiful sea creatures so charming they even inspired Disney to make a movie about them. But sirens, in ancient times, they would have rather inspired a horror film. The most famous mention of sirens is found in Homer's Odyssey, where the sea monsters are more like birds, as they are depicted with wings and a beak. They lured people into the depths of the sea, singing them an incredibly beautiful but deadly song. To resist the temptation, Odysseus's crew filled their ears with wax, and the captain was tied tightly to the ship. Modern researchers believe that ancient sailors most likely observed marine mammals, manatees or dugongs. These animals are slightly taller than a human, have flippers that from afar might resemble hands, and are capable of turning their head from side to side. Sailors often ate poorly, didn't see a living soul for years, and drank a lot. It's no wonder that one day, in a mass hallucination, they saw beautiful maidens. Now let's dive on to a misunderstood recent monster from Loch Ness Lake. Loch Ness, a Scottish lake, has always been associated with a dubious reputation. For centuries, it has been the alleged dwelling place of mysterious creatures. Then, on May 2, 1933, the first official report of a lake monster appeared in the news. But was there really a monster? And where did it come from? Let's dive into the mystery. According to accounts, Loch Ness is home to either a whole host of monsters or some immortal creature. The first mentions of it supposedly date back to the Neolithic era, with carvings found in the Balmaqueen Caves depicting strange creatures. The earliest written account was considered a chapter from the book The Life of St. Columba, written around 565 AD by Abbot Adamnan of Iona. It describes the saint's encounter with a beast, the Loch Ness Monster was also mentioned in The History of Scotland by Hector Bose, 16th century, Northern Memories by Richard Frank, dated 1694, and A Tour in the Whole Island of Great Britain by Daniel Defoe, 1726. In 1886, an article about the Loch Ness Monster appeared in the Glasgow Evening News. Upon closer examination, many of these accounts crumbled into dust. Some stories were purely fictional while others were unverified rumors, like those from Defoe's book and the Glasgow Evening News article. Some stemmed from confusion, while others were clear speculations. The Neolithic-era carvings were taken out of context. The writhing monsters were ornamental symbols common in Scotland, and part of a larger pattern. St. Columba's encounter with the creature was merely one of his miraculous deeds meant to prove his sanctity. The history of Scotland was essentially a collection of myths and legends. Richard Frank's account was severely distorted. He saw not a monster, but a floating island resembling one. Frank himself believed it was nothing else than the natural vegetation or reeds standing upright in the water due to natural causes. Some accounts were akin to saying, they didn't find a drowning body so a monster must have eaten it, or someone is scaring salmon in the lake. In short, until 1933, no one had genuinely seen monsters in Loch Ness. 
So what happened in 1933? In May, the small Scottish newspaper The Northern Chronicle carried the first credible eyewitness account of a giant creature in Loch Ness. Mr. and Mrs. McKay claimed to have seen this creature splashing about in the water. They reported this to their friend Alex Campbell, who was a fisheries inspector and also worked as a correspondent for two newspapers. By the way, it later turned out that Campbell had fabricated much of the story. Mrs. McKay had witnessed strong water turbulence, while her husband, who was driving, hadn't seen anything. Campbell, who had long believed in something strange in the lake, was frustrated that no one was interested, so he took advantage of the situation. In August of the same year, a new report came to the Inverness newspaper. A man named Mr. Spicer claimed that while driving along the southern shore of Loch Ness, he had encountered a huge, grotesque prehistoric animal dragging small prey, like a lamb. Then, on November 12, 1933, the world saw the first photograph of the monster. It was taken by Hugh Gray, a resident of Foyer, and appeared with a witness's account in the Scottish newspaper Daily Mail. Experts deemed the image unconvincing. Some believed it was a bottle-nosed whale, a large shark, a log, or even just a dog carrying a stick. Another photograph, this time of the monster's head emerging from the water, was published by the Daily Mail in April 1934. It was taken by London physician Colonel R. Kenneth Wilson. This photograph became the most famous image of the Loch Ness Monster. However, as it later turned out, it was a hoax. For a while, interest in the inhabitant of Loch Ness waned, but it began to rise again in the 1960s. In 1961, a comedy film about Nessie titled What a Whopper, starring pop star Adam Faith, was released. In 1970, American director Billy Wilder relocated Sherlock Holmes to the Loch Ness vicinity for his film The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. For the shoot, they even brought in an elaborate mechanical monster that submerged in the water and has yet to resurface. Groups of enthusiastic scientists organized expeditions in search of the mysterious creature. Such attempts were made in the 1960s and 1970s, but all were in vain. In 1975, English naturalist Peter Scott and American researcher Dr. Robert Rhines suggested giving Nessie an official scientific name, Nessiteris rhombopteryx, which sparked a wave of mockery. In the 1980s, during the era of the Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher, the Loch Ness Monster issue was addressed at the governmental level to prevent the capture of the creature by monster hunters. Nessie came under the protection of the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act, which extended to all wild animals, even those unknown to science. In 2003, a BBC research team conducted a thorough sonar scan of the lake using 600 transmitters, yet again with no results. At some point, many believed the monster had simply died, but reports kept coming in. As a result, in 2016, British specialists made another attempt to explore the lake, this time using a robot. A comprehensive survey of the lake's bottom completely rejected the assumptions of anomalies or crevices where such a large creature could hide. According to scientists, Nessie most likely doesn't exist. Instead, the team documented the existence of a movie prop monster that had sunk during the filming of a Billy Wilder movie. Supposedly, Nessie was sporadically spotted until as recently as 2021. In 2020, a relatively convincing photograph of the creature surfaced on social media, taken by a certain Steve Harrington. However, it turned out to be a huge pike measuring over two and a half meters. Nonetheless, Nessie was even spotted on Apple Maps and Google Street View. Official science doesn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster, but it does acknowledge that people may mistake other things for it. Therefore, in scientific circles, there is still some interest in the problem. Various theories have been put forward. One theory considered the Loch Ness Monster to be a giant eel. This idea emerged in the 1970s. In 1976, biologist Roy McCall collected European eel samples using baited traps in the lake and concluded that Loch Ness had large eels. Their appearance indeed closely resembled what witnesses described when observing the monster. Naturalists Adrian Shine and David Martin noted that most Nessie sightings occurred in areas near river mouths, which were part of the migratory path of local eels. More recent studies in 2018 to 2019 detected a large amount of eel DNA in Loch Ness. 
further supporting this theory of the monster's origin. The average length of a European eel ranges from 60 to 80 centimeters, with some individuals growing up to one and a half meters, but this is far from the size of the monster. However, the question remains, how large is the Loch Ness monster in the famous Colonel's photograph? For instance, LeBlond and Collins, using wave mechanics, estimated its size to be only 0.6 to 2.4 meters. Earlier estimates from the 1970s suggested that the creature in the photograph was about 15, 20 meters long. This assertion is dubious. Taking into account the biomass of Loch Ness, scientists calculated that the lake could sustain a population of 156 eels, weighing 100 kilograms each. If the animal weighed two, three tons, it would be the only representative of its kind in the lake. However, the famous astrophysicist and science popularizer Carl Sagan added some confusion. In his article, If They Are, Can They Be Many, 1976, based on collision physics, he suggested that the lake could house a population of 310-meter-long animals. But this did not change the idea that Nessie was an eel. One could say that this hypothesis failed after Flo Foxen, a U.S. scientist, based on catches from Loch Ness and other freshwater bodies in Europe, calculated that the chances of finding a one-meter-long eel in Loch Ness were only one in 50,000. Meeting an individual over six meters in length was virtually impossible, with such probability approaching zero. In other words, some observations of smaller, unknown creatures could be explained by large eels, but any larger animals spotted in the lake are unlikely to be eels. In the case of Nessie, people most likely mistook anything and everything for a monster, except eels. There were plenty of possibilities. It could have been a Greenland shark, a catfish, a seal, an otter, or even just a bird floating on the water. Objects like logs might have been mistakenly taken for Nessie. Professor Michael Swift from the University of Derby even speculates that if it weren't for the freshwater, it could have been an erect whale's penis protruding from the water. This was what sailors used to mistake for sea monsters.